Well, if I could, before we get started, I, th I thought it would be interesting to do a little bit of trivia. So as, as we were on our way up, Michael and I were talking about this. So Mike, take it away. Yeah, so we, we, we did not have the opportunity to bring pretzels with us today. So oh, we apologize. <laughs> now, let's get that out of the way. Now some of you are wondering. But the good news is we do have a few free pretzel cards that we want to distribute. But you've got to get the answer correct. So the first trivia question, and we'll just go raise your hand. I'll pick somebody. If you're close, you get a card. How many pretzels, we've been in existence now for over 25 years. We actually just celebrated our 25th uh, birthday celebration. In that time, how many pretzels do you think we, we had rolled? Go ahead, raise your hand, take a guess. Go ahead, what do you think? 700 million. Uh, yeah, a little more. Uh, maybe 850 million. Okay, a little more. Anybody? Well, it's a free pretzel card. One billion. You know, it's close enough. It's 1.7 billion. So free pretzel card for the gentleman over there. Good job. And you know what? Just because you participated, the other guys, get, since they raised their hand, you also get one. Thank you. Valerie, could you also give that gentleman back there one? One more trivia question. This one's a little easier and we'll make it now. Now a lot of hands will go up now. Uh, but so last question. Um, how many stores do you think we have? Nancy, Nancy. Remember, we're, we're a Lancaster County uh, company, started in Lancaster County. How many stores do you think we have? Go ahead. 150. 150? A little more. Go ahead. 250. 250. A little more. 400. A little more. Okay. I'm gonna Have you guys done any research on yeah. our website yet? <laughs> it's a lot more. It's a lot more. <laughs> anybody, anybody want to guess? Go ahead in the back. 1,500. You Ooh. know what? That's close enough. We have a little over 1,300 stores. We're worldwide. Uh, it's changing every day. I think we're in 28 countries. I believe that's correct. Yeah, 28 countries, majority 48 states. Mm -hmm. Again, it changes daily. So um, a lot larger than people realize, even in Lancaster County. So uh, good job. Free cards of cards for those. I'll pass it over to Bill. Thank you. So some of those answers just then were a little too low to warrant a, a pretzel card, you know, 100 or 50, you know, 150. But I thought what I would do is start telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Florida, so uh, so if any of you that might have Florida going a long way in the in the brackets, thank you very much for your support. Um, I will say I think it's important to note, and I'll get to this later. Uh, and some of you might find be a little shocked. At this I have a Bachelor of Science in Public Recreation. So as you look at yourself and where you go, for, you know where you go from here. Um, I think for me. You know, a lot of people when I talk to about my background, where I'm from, they are a bit shocked to hear what my major is. I was an athlete. I played baseball in, in college. After that, um, I worked with my father. He owned a franchise of Wendy's down in North Central Florida. I oversaw the operations of his stores. We had between 700 and 800 employees in those nine stores. Um, you know, being quite frank, I thought I was set for life. I was 24 years old. My father had this great business. I was kind of running it. And then all of a sudden, in 2000, late 2006, he decided to divest of that. And here I am in a situation going, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Um, I've always, the first company that I started, I was a sophomore in college. I started a carpet cleaning business with a, a buddy of mine that we did in the summer. We'd work half the night uh, cleaning restaurant carpets and things like that. So I always had the entrepreneurial spirit in me and finding a way to, uh, to be successful. So when my dad got out of that business over the years, um, after, that, after the initial shock of not having a job, I, uh, I had to do something. So I went and sold cars for a while. And I learned a lot in that time period. I learned a lot about people. I learned a lot about uh, how tough it is in the business world. You know, here I am, a 24, 25 year old kid. I've got guys out there that are in their 40s and 50s selling cars, trying to support a family. And, uh, you know, they didn't take too kindly to the young guy, you know, taking money out of their, their family's mouths. But uh, so after that, I, I, I knew I wanted to start another company. So I started looking at Entrepreneur Magazine, uh, looking at franchise concepts to start, and came across, I don't remember the, the franchise concept, but it was a landscaping and lawn maintenance business. And I thought to myself, heck, I can do that on my own. So I literally, I owned a home in Gainesville, Florida. I packed everything up in my U-Haul, drove to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm fr originally from North Carolina. Um, spent one night with my grandparents. The next day I was peddling out there, found a place to live, and then I was out in the communities trying to drum up business. I was very fortunate 
that I was able to st start a company and grow it very rapidly, that uh, after three years I sold that company. After that, I invested in a chain of fitness centers. We had nine fitness centers in two states. Uh, we were able to grow that rapidly. Uh, there was a difference in opinion on which direction to go, um, so I decided to let the, the rest of the ownership buy me out. Um, I think the, more, you know, the big thing behind this is you know, to believe in yourself and what you can accomplish. And uh, if you can do that, I will guarantee you, you can accomplish anything that you want to. So as I continue to grow, grow uh, professionally, um, I invested in a corrugated business. Corrugated, we did business with the major consumer product companies in the country to help them take their products to market. That you see these corrugated displays in uh, grocery stores, things like that. We did business with the Procter & Gamble's of the world, the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Companies. I helped grow that company from 1994 to 2004 from $10 million company to $250 million company. Uh, that was both through organic growth and through acquisition. That's what brought me to Pennsylvania. In 1999, we acquired a company in York. My family and I settled in Lancaster. And that was my first exposure to Auntie Anne's. So, because um, I'd never heard of it before being from the South. Um, so I had no idea the magnitude of it. Um, in 2005, it happened to be that my neighbor um, bought Auntie Anne's. He had moved in next door to us after we'd been in town for a couple of years. And when we sold our company in 2004, we sold to a publicly traded company. And I, two of the partners stayed on for a couple of years. And one of my mottos is, if I'm not having fun, I've got to find something else to do. And I still live by that today. So I started looking for companies to buy. Uh, got close on some, and then when my neighbor bought Auntie Anne's, he was looking to grow it. It was not going to be a legacy company for him, so I joined forces with him to help grow Auntie Anne's, and it's been a tremendous opportunity and a joy to be able to work with the people that I worked with, or work with. Um, so I joined in 2007. We sold the company in November of 2010 to a private equity firm out of Atlanta called Focus Brands. Focus Brands also owns Cinnabon, Carvel, Moe's Southwest Grill, and Schlotzky's Deli. And fortunately for us, we were the first acquisition that they had ever made that the brand was not broken. And I think that says a lot for the history of our company and the way it was founded. It was founded based on the principles of giving back. So when Ann and Jonas Byler started Auntie Ann's in 1988, the sole purpose of that was so they could generate enough revenue to where they could provide free counseling services in their local community of Gap. It did not start with the idea that this was going to become the largest of its kind in the world. And so even today, if you take all of our competitors and put them together, we are still larger than all of them put together. So I think as you look forward into your careers and, and how to, you know, whether it be through business or through personal life, um, for us, since we are the largest in the world, we have to have the discipline to push ourselves to change and to grow. Our competitors cannot make us do that. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's really a neat company. And I'm, I'm sure that, well, I hope all of you in here have had the opportunity to enjoy an Auntie Anne's pretzel. But, uh, you know, the experiences that I've had throughout my career, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting in that I've always tried to surround myself with people smarter than me. And I think that is, for me personally, that's one, been one of the keys to my success. Because I cannot, I can have a vision, and, uh, but I cannot carry it all out by myself. But if I surround myself with people that are smarter than I am, we can accomplish anything. And I've been just been so fortunate each step of my career in different businesses that I've started, started, bought, sold, whatever, I've always had that philosophy. And I'm about empowering people. Being an athlete <coughs> uh, and coming from a sport with baseball that you fail 70% of the time and you're considered successful, you know, baseball is pretty humbling. And so for me, uh, it, you know, I, my management style is a lot like a coach. And I empower people to make decisions. I recognize or do the best I can to recognize when they may be struggling in a certain area. 
that I will then step in because certainly I'm the one that's ultimately accountable. But I trust my team, their team members, to run an effective business, and if they need me, they know that they can get me. So, you know, I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time at the end because I will have a tendency to, I love to talk, especially in this setting. Um, you know, and, but I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for questions at the end. And I want to tell you a little bit about how Mike and I met. Um, in 2002, I've got three children. Right now, I've got a daughter who's a freshman at the University of Alabama. Well, Mike was an educator. The first class that he ever had, she was a third grade student of his. My other two children eventually ended up having Mike in fifth grade. But I saw something special in Mike that I knew that he would be a valuable member of our team at Auntie Anne's. And now he was, well, I'm not gonna steal, I'm not gonna start telling about your, your background, but um, I can't, but this is another example of recognizing talent that's somewhere else. Maybe it's not even in, in the field that you are. But if you find people that have a great attitude, that they, that align with you, take those opportunities to engage with them. Because if I would not have done that with Mike, we would definitely not be as successful as we've been within our company-owned store operations. So at this point, Mike, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you, Bill. My pleasure. Thanks for those kind words. <laughs> you know, I noticed that Bill had mentioned before, uh, before that that he always looks for people that are smarter than him. So I'm assuming that's the <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. That's a win. A little bit of my background, Bill kind of touched upon it. Um, I'm originally from Reading, Pennsylvania. Um, I graduated from Millersville University in 2002. I was the uh, first uh, college graduate in my family. As Bill had mentioned, I have a bachelor's in elementary education. I, I was a school teacher. I started out in third grade and uh, loved it very much. And I was actually pursuing my principalship uh, when I was with the school district of Lancaster. Um, taught for six years, third grade, then fifth grade. My ultimate goal is that I, I wanted to be a superintendent within a school district and I felt that I had the ability to do that and I was on the right track. But it started with the principalship and I was actually three classes away from finishing my master's and jumping into a principal job when the opportunity um, with Auntie Anne's came about. And it was, it was a difficult time, you know, because I really loved what I was doing and I never imagined doing anything else. But I did, I always thought in the back of my mind that I had a certain skill set that wasn't utilized in education. I was interested in trying something different. Um, and I was never afraid to really try something different. I mean, I had never worked a day uh, in my life in food or any, any real uh, business, uh, a job. All I ever knew was education. But I figured, hey, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'm either going to love it or I'm not. And if I don't, I can go back to teaching. Well, I can tell you that five years later, it's the best decision that I ever made. Well, since it were video, other than marry, <coughs> marrying my wife, I have to say that. First. That's probably the best. And then the switch to, to Auntie Anne's. So a little bit about what I do. I'm the director of company store operations with Auntie Anne's. I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of our 14 company-owned stores. I also, anytime there's a special event that has an operational piece that Auntie Anne's is a part of, our team gets involved. And we do some really cool things. Last few years, we've done the NBA All-Star Game. Uh, we have uh, last year and this year, actually in a few weeks, we have coming up 10 Tebow Celebrity Golf Tournament. Uh, most recently, uh, we started a small partnership with NASCAR, so we've done some NASCAR events, and I gotta tell you, I'm not a NASCAR fan. That was a really neat experience. Um, so you never know, and uh, you never know what direction we're going to go. Whatever and Bill had mentioned, you know, Bill says, hey, I think we should do this, make it happen. Well, we might not know exactly how to do that, but we find a way. And one of the questions I get a lot is, well, why do you have company stores? I mean, when you think about it, we had mentioned earlier, we have more than 1,300 locations. We only have 14 company stores, why? Well, there's really three reasons. Uh, number one, I mean, hey, we're in business, so we're hoping that they're gonna be profitable and we can make money with those stores. Um, number two, it's a testing ground. Um, for our franchise community, we, we, we test product, we test equipment. In fact, we, we tested a new product in one of our stores yesterday. Um, so we're constantly rolling in uh, test products in our stores. Uh, third, probably most importantly, we wanna be a voice for the franchise system. You know, we want to be able to say, hey, we understand what you're going through because we're going through it as well. But there's a lot of pressure on our group. When you think about it again, over 1,300 locations, we're only 14 of them. But we're expected to run the 14 best stores in the entire system. That's a big challenge. And I'll be honest with you, we're not there yet. 
but we continue to make strides every year to see that we are truly the best in what we do. We, we want to set the bar for our franchise community. Within our group, we've made a lot of strides here in the last few years. But within our group, there's one message that we constantly deliver that I think is important for a group like this. And if you talk to any member of our team, they, they can tell you at great lengths about it. And it, we're constantly challenging ourselves to set ourselves apart. We talk about that all the time. You know, as I sit here today and I see, you know, business students, you're all graduating in a few years. A lot of you are going to be, be competing for a lot of the same jobs. How are you setting yourselves apart? Well, within our group, it starts really with two things. Number one, we're constantly asking ourselves, how can we be innovators in what we do? Now, Auntie Anne's been around for a long time, okay? And the art of making the pretzel has been perfected. So that we can't be innovators in that area. However, there are countless opportunities to be innovative when it comes to improving customer service, training our employees, finding ways to reduce costs, driving sales. So that's what we try to do within our group. We try to think of things that have never been done that we think can truly drive the business. And not just for our 14 stores, we want to prove it out. We want to share it with the system so that the franchise partners can have that and be successful. Actually, uh, last year we came up with a new training module, a certification for our individuals that work the register. We spent a whole year proving that out. It's been a huge success. So we're now in the process of rolling out uh, this to the system-wide so that uh, franchise partners can use this, utilize it in their stores, and see the same benefits. That's why we're there. So <clears throat> really being innovators in what you do, and I've, I've used that personally in everything that I've done. The second piece that we're constantly talking about, and it's really important for our organization, is we don't ever want yes people, but we never say no. And I think that's really important to, I mean, it's, it drives our success. In that we never want yes people. We don't, pe we don't want people in our organization who just agree to simply agree. We want individuals who are going to challenge, who are going to think differently, who are confident to share their thoughts, their opinions what direction they think we should go. And within our group, and Bill kind of talked about it, we're very similar in that, kind of run my group sort of as a coach as well. You know, when the decision is made, whether you agree or disagree, we move forward with it full steam ahead. That's important. So that's that whole idea of, you know, you never want to be that yes person. But on the flip side, you never want to say no. What we mean to that is when there's an opportunity that's presented to you, whether you think you're ready for it, if you think it's too challenging, it's going to stretch you, you're just not comfortable, it doesn't matter, say yes, make it happen. You know, a lot of times things are presented, I have no idea how we're going to make it happen, but we say yes, and we say we're going to figure out a way. When Auntie Anne's, the opportunity to work for Auntie Anne's was presented to me, I mean, again, I knew nothing about it, but I thought, hey, I'll figure it out. You hear Bill's story, it's so true. He, he's taken part in so many different opportunities that throughout his career where he didn't really know a lot about what he was doing, but he figured it out. He wasn't afraid to say yes. <clears throat> I can share a personal story. Just a few weeks ago, Auntie Anne's had the opportunity to be on Fox News, Fox and Friends. It was a live national segment on TV. Um, and it was gonna be viewed by you know over a million viewers. Well, I was asked to do the segment. Initially, <coughs> when they asked me, I, I said no. <laughs> In my head, I was like, no, I don't want to do that. That's I'm way too stressful. I, uh, I don't need to do that. But then I, I reminded myself that it's important. You know, if it's going to make me better, if, if I'm going to improve because of it, I'm going to be better because of it, then I need to do it. So I said yes. And, you know, I wasn't perfect. But I'll tell you what, I've learned a lot. And it completely changed my perspective. Because I can tell you that there was a time in my life that this day would have brought some anxiety. But let me tell you, once you have a live camera in front of you, and it's, it's national television, everything else is easy. So I'm, I'm better because of it. So I'm, you know, it's, it's important that I, I took part in that. Auntie Anne's, you know, that's within our company store group. But that whole idea of being an innovator sets yourself apart is so important in everything we do. Recently, we had the opportunity to take part in our first reality TV show on A&E called Be the Boss. And it was a great opportunity for Auntie Anne's because it allowed us to choose two employees in our system who worked very hard in setting themselves apart. So we were able to have them be a part of the show where they had the chance to truly capture the American dream and become their very own boss. We have a segment I'd love to show you. It's a short four or five minute segment, I'm not sure, about the show, uh, if you, in case you missed it. Um, and then the bill will go from there. So let, I'll get the video started.
the loss of the world's largest hand-rolled soft pretzel franchise has called two of his hardest working employees to headquarters. I don't have any idea why I was sent here, why I was selected. For a week-long job interview. It was the toughest day of work, especially because I wasn't getting help. I don't know if I should come and assist you, but I'm small, so. They'll go head to head. How's that bottle looking? in the most extraordinary challenge of their careers. He's helpful to an extent. And in the end, one will walk away with a promotion, but the other will earn the real prize, their very own Auntie Anne's store. So, my name is Bill Dunn, and I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer here at Auntie Anne's. So, Shanti, you're from Florida? Yes, sir. Boynton Beach. Hi, guys! I'm Sean Samora. I'm currently assistant store manager in Boynton Beach, Florida. And Elazar, you're from Oregon? I'm from Woodbridge, Oregon, yeah. Well, sir, would you like to try a sample of a pretzel dog? I'm Elazar. I'm a store manager at NTN's Pretzels in Woodbridge, Oregon. I guess you're kind of wondering why you're here? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit, right? Well, I've had a number of people tell me all about you, and there was something special about each one of you, the two of you have come out as two of the best of the best that are in our system. We've got a unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to join Auntie Anne's business management team. Wow. And this promotion has the opportunity to double your income. You're here because we're looking for great people, but the tough part's going to be there's only one position available. The two of you are, are going to be competing against one another. You're going to be going to our Park City Center store, and just like you do in your stores, every week you get in all your product. We refer to that as load-in day. So y'all are going to go in, you're going to be putting all of the product away, and while you do that, be able to fulfill the needs of the guests that are coming to the counters. You're going to be meeting a gentleman, uh, Mike Mercado, who is the director of our company-owned stores. He's going to be observing. And I'm going to be looking for the one that demonstrates the leadership qualities that I think are going to be valuable as a member of our business management team. And one of you, I'm expecting, will step up and really take a leadership role and show why you're deserving of this one job. How you guys doing? Hi. I'm Mike Mercado. This is the director of Company Star Operations. Pleasure to meet you both. Okay. First, there's a van outside that has all the product we need for this location. We want you guys to get changed to uniforms and get going. You guys ready? Yeah. Yes. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. Get that truck. <laughs> Let me get the cold stuff in the refrigerator. Right one of them is getting the promotion. What they don't know is that one of them will become the next Auntie Anne's franchisee. Part of the role as a president is you're faced with making decisions every day that impact people's lives. And it's always very difficult. Shanta Elazar, please come in. After a great deal of thought, I feel like the best person for this job is Shanta. Well, where we are right now and understanding that, you know, Shanta was awarded the position, how, how do you feel? I feel a little disappointed. Um, I'm not gonna question your judgment. Um, you know, I wanted to succeed. But sometimes things don't work out like that. Well, Elazar, I've got a secret for you. There's much more to this than, than you understand. When you and Shanta first came to town, you know, I explained to you that this was, this was about a promotion. There was one job available. And the truth is, I was putting you both to the test to see which one of you ultimately would be the best boss. That's why you're sitting here. Because I feel like you're the person that is the best boss. And what I would like to do is award you with the keys to your very own Auntie Anne store. <laughs> you deserve it. You did a great job. I just got awarded with my own storage. Um, 
I'm, I'm speechless right now. I just don't know what to say. Seeing all these people here, really made me feel like I'm part of a family now. Can't believe that I have my own story. Everybody ready? Go for it. Go for it. You know, every time I see that, you know, it brings back those memories. And um, Elazar is a special young man, so is Shanta. Um, and, you know, I've always been one, you know, we've been approached before by reality TV. And, you know, so we look at it and then, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're aligned with what the goals of the show are. And I'm a big believer in the American dream can come true. And these were two individuals that stood out, and both of them received something that was life-changing. And it, so for me, and if I look back at Elazar, and a lot of what I believe in is, you know, even if you look at his face and how he handled that, you know, you didn't win. He was, you know, sure he was upset, but he was composed, he still had a positive attitude, and I mean, Though you're going to experience those things in your life. You're going to experience disappointment. But make sure that you keep that positive attitude. You know, to, today we're looking actively for a location for LSR out in the Oregon area. Um, and I can't wait. You know, his, the, so the store that you saw was just, that was a mock-up in Lancaster so we could show really what the award was. So we're actively looking for a location with him and Shanta has joined us uh, in a support type role helping us out in the state of Florida. The, um, you know, I th there are a lot of smart people in this world that are a heck of a lot smarter than I am. And I think one thing that you have to keep in mind is it doesn't matter how smart you are. If you don't have an attitude that's positive to go along with that, I will guarantee you will not maximize your opportunities in life. Guarantee it. So as you go out in the world, it's going to be competitive. As Mike said, what are you doing that's innovative? To separate yourself from that competitor that's also going into that interview. You know, are you portraying the positive attitude, the can do? Also one that's caring and one that's humble. Um, you can, I'm telling you, you can do anything you want to in life. I could have gone through and, you know, in, in the experiences in my life, I could have come up with every excuse in the world why I would not be successful. I chose not to do that. So we're all faced you know, with choices day in and day out. The most difficult choice to make is the right choice. Generally, the easy choice is the wrong choice. So when you get to those crossroads and you're thinking about it, whether it be personally or professionally, think about how difficult that choice is and make sure you take the time to think about that. There are a lot of people that work hard in this world. A lot of people. But you need to work smart with it. You need to be flexible. Um, you know, and especially in today's society, I mean, it's tough out there. Thank goodness, I mean, I know that y'all are, I don't know how many of you in here are seniors and you're gonna be graduating. Um, you know, it's not easy and it's not fair. Um, and, you know, I, I experience it with, with my kids and my daughter that's in college. Well, that's not fair. Well, you know what? Life's not fair. So don't use excuses to get in your way, whether it's fair, you know, or, or be the victim. There's, there are a couple of books that I want to tell you about that I think that, that will help you as, you as you go forward. One of them, uh, if you have not met it or read it, is Who Moved My Cheese? I would suggest everybody write that down. The book is by Spencer Johnson. Life is changing. In anything you do, life is always changing. It's how you react to that. It will help you understand maybe more about yourself and some of the challenges that you may face. The second book, I uh, just want to make sure I get the author right, uh, is John Miller. And it's called QBQ. And it's the question behind the question. And what that is about, it's about personal accountability. I can't make anybody in this room change. Only you can do that. But the one person I can change is myself. 
So if I'm not getting the outcome that I'm looking for in business or with anybody on my team, rather than going, gosh, Mike, why won't you change? Well, you know what? The first thing I need to do is, what could I do differently to help create change? I can change myself. I cannot change Mike. If I change myself, it may change the outcome of what I'm looking for with Mike. And the other one is called Flipping the Switch, also by John Miller. So, you know, I've considered myself all of my life a visionary. <coughs> I try to look forward. I can't live in today. I'm looking forward. Where are the next opportunities? How are we going to grow? But any time I've ever done that, I've always had a filter that I use when it comes to making decisions. And that filter consists of, in, in the Auntie Anne's world, the decision that I'm getting ready to make, what impact does this have on our franchise partners? What impact does this have on our employees? And what impact does this have on our guests? Those are the three key elements. If it cannot get back past one of those, the decision, I will not approve it. Because without those three stakeholders, our business is not successful. So keep in mind, as you, you know, you're going to be faced, and in, in, in it's, you know, you heard me on there, the decisions that I make impact a lot of people's lives. Some that I'll never meet. But that doesn't mean that I don't think about them. And what's the impact it's going to have, whether it be on them, their family, their kids, and that's a part of what, you know, that's what you sign up for. So don't lose, don't lose sight of the influence that you have, the decisions that you make have on other people. Regardless of where you are within a company, whether it be your own company, a big company, a small company, you have got to keep that in mind. Um, you know, at this point, you know, I'd like to, I think we've got about 10 or 15 minutes to open it up to questions. And, and ordinarily in this setting, I would have been entertaining questions all along because I'm more of a, let's talk, have a conversation. So um, Mike, come on up here and hopefully we can get some questions. And I will not stop talking until we at least get some questions. So let's go. Because March Madness will be starting soon. <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned in the beginning you saw Mike as a third grade teacher of your daughter, is that correct? Correct. What were the qualities you saw in him as a third grade teacher that made you believe that he could work for your company? Well, when I first met Mike, uh, when he was teaching that third grade class, it's kind of interesting. He only, he, there was just something about him that was different. One, I'm an athlete, he was an athlete, natural connection. But there was something that he always did with his students. He would encourage them to bring in trivia questions, dealing with sports. So they would bring him in, and nobody had ever stumped him. So my daughter came home, and being the big sports nut, I came up with a question, sent her back with it, I stumped him. <laughs> it should be noted that the question was a baseball question from like 1910. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was that old. But, um, but as I got to know Michael over the, the, you know, he taught my daughter in third grade, then he taught all of our kids in fifth grade. Um, you know, I got to see how he, how he ran his, how he dealt with the kids. And how he motivated them to do things that, or how he provided influence to get them to do things that I'd never seen teachers do before. And that, that to me was a unique characteristic in seeing how he was creative enough and innovative enough to be able to, as this big, burly athlete, communicate to these third graders and get these third graders to do what he wanted them to do without them realizing they were doing it. And, and that's also been kind of a saying of mine. You know, one of the keys to life or success is getting people to do what you want them to do without them realizing they're doing it. And, um, but he was able to do that. So when, when we were looking at, for our company owned stores to take them to the next level, um, I thought about Mike. And we actually had a conversation. He's been, you know, I knew he had no experience. But I knew that he had the leadership capabilities and, and the drive to be able, you know, you put something in front of him, he's going to figure it out. <coughs> and, and so that's, that's what it was. Yes, sir. Uh, going off of that, which you mentioned earlier, trying to stand out, what are some of the ways that you uh, deliberately work to make yourself stand out from the rest? Well, one thing, when I meet people, I look them in the eye, I give them a firm handshake and a smile. You know, being from the South, you know, I was taught, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Um, 
But for me, I mean, there's nothing that stands out more to me when I meet somebody, when they come up and they shake my hand, I can learn so much from that individual just from that handshake. And if they're going to look me in the eye. And a lot of times, I'll even comment on it. That was a great handshake. And I'll do that to kids. You know, I might meet some of my kids' friends. And I mean, it just shows, you know, a level of, you know, respect um, for one another, uh, being confident. But I, I just think there's a lot in, you learn a lot from somebody from the little things. Um, and, and certainly, you can't prejudge, you know, when somebody's coming up. And, you know, everybody deserves an opportunity. It's what you do with that opportunity that's going to make a difference. So for me, it's, it's eye contact, it's a handshake, it's a smile, it's body language, um, things like that. People underestimate the, the impact of a positive attitude. Yes, ma'am. This is from Mr. Mercado. I was wondering, when you first entered the business world, did you make any mistakes that were like really big blunders? <laughs> I'd like to think that I haven't made um, any mistakes that have been that big, but yes, I've made many mistakes and I continue. Uh, and I think that's one thing that I, I focus on that kind of sets me apart is that I'm not afraid to fail, uh, although at the same time, I often say failing is not an option, but I, I'm not afraid to try something. Um, so, you know, knowing that I don't always have all the answers, but eventually I'm going to figure it out. You know, I have a team behind me that's supportive, that has been in the industry for a long time, so they know a lot of the uh, specifics to, to what we do. And those things can be taught. I mean, so often in, in different fields, the specifics can be taught with real life experience. It's, it's the things that can't be taught in the classroom uh, that I think are important, that I think really drive success. So the answer to your question, yes, I make mistakes, but hopefully not that big mistakes. Yes, sir. Um, earlier in class today, we were talking about businesses and reducing the impact that they have on the environment. I was wondering, since you guys are talking about innovation, if you guys had any like, projects or things in the works, or what, what you have done uh, to reduce your, I guess, impact. You know, certainly when we're looking at design and construction of our stores, you know, we're looking at opportunities. How do we, how are we more environmentally friendly? Whether it be through lighting, through you know the the materials that we're using within the store. Um, the challenging part that's come out of this is a lot of these, t a lot of times, you know, it, it's too bad that they make it. It's more expensive to be environmentally friendly, and you know we have franchise partners that are that are building stores. That certainly it's important to make sure they're built as economically as they can, so they can get the return on investment that they need in order for it to be a viable business. Um, so we're always looking at the materials that we're using, trying to drive cost out and be environmentally friendly. Uh, the second thing is um, within our packaging, trying to you know go to maybe craft versus white reducing the amount of ink. Um, I think recently we've taken styrofoam cups out. Um, but you know, it's, I think that you know, it, it's the prudent thing to do. However, uh, the way that it's set up uh, makes it difficult, not to say that it's not right, um, but the cost associated with it, it, it tends to be a barrier where I think it shouldn't be a barrier. There should be some encouragement. I think it, it's good to mention that um, I'm actually on a conference call on Monday um, mm -hmm. where we're um, working on getting all of our company stores certified as green stores. Um, we don't know um, everything that's going to that entails, but we're working to see that that happens. Okay. So, from a waste perspective, you know, because our products are made fresh in the store all day long. After 30 minutes, they're to be discarded. So what we also do is we participate in the food donation connection, which is where these products that cannot be sold due to them, uh, the time frame, we package them up, put them in the refrigerator, and we actually give them to those who are less fortunate um, to help feed folks. I think I saw another question over here. Somebody? You didn't have one? Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you, um, when your neighbor moved in mm -hmm. beside you, what level did you start at in the company uh, when you first joined him, and how long did it take you to get to the position there? Um, so he moved in a couple of years after we did. That would have been in like 2002. He acquired Auntie Anne's in 2005. I joined in July of 2007. Uh, I started. I my first role was the chief operating officer. So then. Uh, 
within probably a year, it was president and COO. Yes, ma'am. Um, you started out um, with smaller companies, and what was what were some of the biggest differences going from a smaller company to a really large company like Um Less people. <laughs> you know, with a small company, you have less less employees, but that doesn't mean that you lose. You don't. You you still care and nurture and develop. Uh, the network of employees that you have. But as, as your organization gets larger and the layers become more, um, it makes it more difficult to actually touch everybody as often as you would like um, to make sure that you're doing everything you can. I mean, one of the, for me, one of the most rewarding aspects of what I do is helping develop people and seeing them uh, move on to other companies at higher levels. Um, I, it, it's just, I like to see people grow. I like to see them, their opportunities uh, come about, and maybe help them achieve goals that they never thought that they would be able to achieve. Yes, sir. What's the average cost to become a franchise partner? The average cost, including the franchise fee, is going to range somewhere between, say, one hundred eighty and two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. So, is it? You know, it's kind of middle of the road. Um, at the uh, yeah, McDonald's is much more. Um, and you know, in, you know, last year in 2012, it was the best year in the history of the company from an openings perspective. 25-year-old uh, company in 2012, we opened 202 units around the world. 117 of those were domestic, 85 were international. Um, and you know, I expect you know we've, but a lot of that has to do is, you know, whether you whether you start a company, whether you join a company, uh, whether you purchase a company. It's, it's being a visionary. Where, where can we grow? What's the prudent thing to do? How are we aligned? Um, and I think as an organization, we've done a great job of identifying opportunities for growth. And then understanding, as Mike said, um, you might not have all the answers, but you know it's the right thing and you have to figure it out. You just have to. Um, and I think that sometimes another thing to keep in mind as you go out into the world is you're going to know at times that you need to get from here to there. And if you wait, and you know, you're afraid to take that first step, and, but you're trying to gather all the information that you can um, to take that first step, a lot of times if you wait too long, by the time you take that first step, really you don't need to go there. You need to go over here. So I equate it to like a soccer, soccer ball. As you're going down the field, you're dribbling it, keeping it within a you know, a span like this. You're not just booting it out there and then trying to catch it because it doesn't work that way. Same thing with me on business. I see we need to get over there. I'm like, okay, let's start. I don't have all the answers yet, but let's start going. Let's keep analyzing, gathering information so we're much closer to that destination than if we were to sit here and wait and wait and get all the information before we take the first step. Yes, sir. Uh, how have you found it's been the best way to motivate people? Whew. I think, you know, you got to care. Um, you have to spend time with people. You have to get to know them. I mean, one of the things that I really like doing is walking around the office and talking with folks about non-related work. You know, I talk to them about their kids, um, what's going on this weekend. I mean, I don't, I don't get, I don't interfere, you know, with the personal life. But I think that there needs to be a connection. And if you've got a connection with somebody and building that relationship, then, then you, you've, you've bridged maybe a gap that then helps. When, so when you start having ideas, they're more, more inclined to adapt to those and become motivated by it. So I think it comes down, you know, it, it's people, getting to know them, showing respect, building a relationship. Yes, sir. I'm on your website here, and I noticed with Tom Brady and Kamara it said, you uh -oh. have Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram link. Uh -huh. How has implementing Annie Ann's and social media affected business and what you do? Well, um, I'm not the social media expert, but <laughs> Valerie, you might be able to speak into a little. I do have a Twitter account. 
hey, this is a great opportunity for me to pick up some followers. <laughs> Have I? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's, 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 at, it's at Bill P. Dunn is my Twitter handle. And um, so I'd love for you guys to start following and get my clout score up. <laughs> but, you know, if you want to talk a little bit about social media. And sure. Consumers interact with us in different ways, so it's about being where they are. So we have um, over, I think, about 750 thousand people on Facebook that follow us and it's really important that we engage with them and, and also be a resource so if they have questions or concerns they can talk to us in a form that best suits them. Calling a 1-800 number anymore just isn't always suitable for everyone so again sharing information that can be helpful for them not only about our product but just overall um, in business or their lifestyle uh, we share sometimes tips on recipes uh, we also share tips on shopping. So it's more than just pretzels. It's, it's about connecting with guests in a meaningful way. Is that helpful? Yes, very. And once again, that is Bill P. P. Dunn. Plug <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, ta da. Uh, yes, sir. One of the issues our students uh, struggle with often is despite the fact that they're business uh, majors, they don't really know specifically what their tests will be or career path will be. Can you give us some insights into your organization and perhaps identifying various positions that they could aspire to? Well, you know, over the years, uh, we've been very active in, in providing opportunities for internships and throughout our company um, in all departments that, that give, you know, whether it be a marketing major or a business major, an opportunity to join our company for a summer or a period of time to understand more about whether it be our company and, and just how business in general works. Um, so I think that's one opportunity that we provide folks. Um, the, uh, you know, I think that, you know, and I can relate it, I guess, uh, it's probably for me, you know, once again, I knew what I, what I wanted to do. I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I didn't have the business degree. Um, but I knew I could do it. I believed and I could do it. I love working with people. Um, and, I, and I, once again, you know, for me, failure wasn't an option. Now, I failed some, um, but I believed in myself and what I was trying to do. I remember I was probably 22 years old, and I set a goal for myself. By the time I was 40, I wanted to be a millionaire. Now, how many, you know, I don't know if any of you are in your early 20s yet, if you've got any goals like that. But if you're not, you've got established goals. So everything that I was doing, I would like to think everything, I'm sure that I've swayed here and there, but uh, was working towards that goal. And um, I did not achieve it at 40, but I was pretty dang close to it. So then I set the next one and the next one. And so, you know, I'm at a stage in my career at, at age 50, I'm, I'm looking at the end now so I can I can spend time with my children and my wife um, because I will say that probably uh, one of my strengths and one of my weaknesses is one as I overcomplify, oversimplify things. That's why once again you need to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Um, and I guess you could say that I'm, I'm a workaholic. I never stop. And thank goodness for a great wife and great kids because I can't tell you how many birthdays, games that I've missed. Um, but certainly, if I would like to think if I did not miss those, we would not have the lifestyle that we have today. So life is about sacrifices. Life is about choices. Life's about having people that support you. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all up to you. You know, your, your professors cannot change you. They cannot make you read that book. They cannot make you prepare for that interview. That is you. So, and you know, with my son and getting to know the kids that he's in school with, um, and he's in South Carolina at a golf academy, you know, I hear his roommate talking about, my uh, college counselor hasn't been working with me enough to help get me placed with a golf scholarship. Um, 
And, you know, he, he, the other day I saw him and he said, you know, it really frustrates me playing in these golf tournaments. Um, and he knows the guys that he's playing with are cheating. You know, and uh, so when I, I had to fly back home for a few days and I came back and I saw him, I said, you know what? You can't do anything about that guy that's cheating. But be good enough to beat the cheater. Focus on yourself and be good enough to beat the cheater. And I gave him the book, the QBQ. The, the young man's from Switzerland. He's a senior in high school. And um, I said, Kevin, I think if you read this book, it has the opportunity to help give you a different outlook, not only with golf, but in anything that you're going to look to accomplish. I didn't even talk to my son about it. And then, so come to find out, my son says, well, can I hold on? My son's a sophomore in high school down in Hilton Head. And he said, can I hold on to the book? I said, sure. All of a sudden, I see he tweets. You know, I've, what do you say? Uh, something about I've made a new choice or something like that. I've read 100 pages in two days. And he says, and then it says, I've never done that. <laughs> um, so it's easy reading for those of you who going, oh, geez, here's this big book this guy's given us to read. It's like a couple hundred pages or something. Um, but really, I mean, you guys, um, there are so many opportunities out there. They're out there. It's just, do you want it bad enough? And do you have the self-discipline to go after it? We're over time. Any more questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure.